uh, just the overview. Uh, what I want to do next is uh, introduce our speakers. Um, we have a, first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers, especially those on um, the European continent for taking time out of their schedules. It's uh, getting towards dinner time for Tracy and Denise, so thank you in advance. Um, I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they appeared on the paper that they're going to be talking about today, although as I understand this order of authorship is completely arbitrary. Uh, I know the work that they did is equal contributions from all of them, but I'll start with uh, Tracy, uh, Tracy Mann. She is a professor of psychology at the University of Minnesota. Uh, her work looks at how people control their health behaviors after deciding to make a change, and she focuses mainly on dieting and eating, but also does some work with smoking and exercise. She's the author of over 50 publications on the topic, including a very recent study that appeared in some small journal you probably have not heard of called the Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA. Um, so that was a quite big publication on the topic. Um, interestingly, from some of this work that Tracy's done, she's been a fairly outspoken critic of dieting, I think is, uh, could be fair to say, um, which perhaps she'll talk a little bit about today. Uh, her work has been funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, NASA, as well as the National Institutes of Health, and she's joining us today from Cambridge, UK, where she is on sabbatical. So welcome, Tracy. Thank you. Uh, next we have Denise de Ritter. Uh, she's a professor in the Department of Clinical and Health Psychology at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, she's an internationally recognized expert on self-regulation of health behavior, an author of over 100 publications on the topic. Uh, she focuses also on the self-regulation of eating behavior as well as consumer behavior. Um, both topics I'm sure she's observed her fair share of self-regulatory failure in. Hopefully not her own, probably hopefully other people's. Uh, she's also the project leader of a European Union funded project called Tempest, which is a team of researchers from nine European countries who seek to understand what children and adolescents can do about their eating patterns and their weight status. And she is joining us from Utrecht, Utrecht in the Netherlands? Utrecht. Utrecht, okay. Probably had it. Uh, welcome, Denise. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Ken Fujita. He's an associate professor of psychology at Ohio State University, where he's the director of the Motivation and Cognitive Science Laboratory, which, as the name states, looks at the interaction between what we think and what we want in determining our behavior. Of course, one of the questions he looks at is the problem of self-control. Um, when and why do some people succeed at self-control while other people fail? Uh, he's the author of over 30 publications on the topic, and his work on self-control has been funded by the National Science Foundation. And Ken is joining us from this side of the pond in Columbus, Ohio. Welcome, Ken. You can't see Ken because he's calling in on the phone, but uh, welcome, Ken. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. All right, so uh, these three uh, distinguished researchers have joined us today for, to discuss a collaborative paper that just appeared in a special issue of Health Psychology on theoretical innovations in social and personality psychology and their implications for health. And this was a special issue that was edited by three of our SPH members, Bill Klein, uh, Alex Rothman, and Linda Cameron, who I believe uh, some of them or all of them are joining us here today as well. Um, in this issue, several teams of researchers collaborated to provide a review of uh, the state of the art in, of research in particular social and personality psychology topics as they relate to a variety of important health issues. And so Tracy, Denise, and Ken, they were tasked with the job of reviewing the literature on self-regulation and their implications for health, which I'm sure was no small feat. And they're here today to talk a little bit about the work that they did, uh, what they see as some of the challenges and the opportunities in this area, as well as to answer any questions that you have about this um, very timely area of research. So I think the first question I would like to pose to them is a very simple question, just so everybody's on the same page. What is self-regulation? Maybe it's a simple question. I'm not sure if it has a simple answer, but I thought I would pitch it to you guys just so we know what we're talking about when we talk about self-regulation. So, who wants to take Wait, a Do you want to go that? first, John? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I, as John says, I think it's a simple question to pose, but a difficult one to answer, because the answer partly depends on who you ask uh, and what their take is. Um, I think in the paper, uh, we decided to take a more uh, inclusive perspective, and we define self-regulation broadly um, as uh, any of the processes, thinking, feeling, behavior, any of the psychological processes um, that uh, allow people to, one, 
select goals for which they that, that they um, might try to pursue, and then two those necessary processes in order to achieve that goal. And when we say the word goal, I think we're being pretty broad here. So it's it's any it's, it's approaching any desired end state or avoiding any undesired uh, uh, end state. Uh, and we tried to be as broad as possible uh, in that perspective and trying to recognize that different people will take different slices of that broad pie and call it self-regulation. Uh, I'm not sure if Tracy or Denise would agree or disagree. I'll, I'll, turn, I'll, I'll turn things over to them. Well, I do agree, and I think the, we try to, uh, there are uh, kind of different views on what self-regulation exactly is, but I think most people would agree that goal setting and goal striving are the main, the main uh, subjects that uh, can be categorized under the heading of self-regulation. So the easy answer is goal setting and goal striving mm -hmm. and all that comes with it, I guess. So we were fairly... Um, uh, on the same page when we decided how to, to, to describe self-regulation in the paper. Uh, and I think uh, we, that most theorists would agree that this, these are the main components uh, of self-regulation. But maybe, Tracy, you have something to add as well? No, I mean, I, didn't, I just felt like we didn't want to really split hairs on this issue. We just wanted to give a really sort of basic overall definition of self-regulation without we, I feel like we kind of wanted to take the drama out of that particular definition, you know, and just, uh, as Denise said, just go with these broad sort of two tasks. Okay. Good. Great, great. So, um, so the task that you guys had on this paper was, as I understand, basically to provide a review of the self-regulation literature. And so I'm just wondering if you could describe a little bit about what the nature of the task was, um, how you guys approached it. I don't know, Tracy, if you have some thoughts about, or if you can share some of those thoughts. Did, is it, are you asking me to give my little overview? <laughs> yes. Of the task, because I yes. was going to give an overview. Okay, well, here's my overview. Um, but actually, first, thank you all for coming. It looks to be there's 32 of you, so thank you. I'm delighted that there's so much interest in this topic. And I think only two of you are my relatives. So that's, <laughs> that's good. I'm not kidding. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I, John kind of said what the task was. That Really, the point of it, I think, was to sort of be useful with social psychology. You know, to show what do social psychologists know that health researchers or people in health settings can, can use. You know, like... A lot of the time, I think, in social psychology, we learn things, but it never goes anywhere. You know, and I think this really was, we should really be asking, you know, Alex and Bill, but, um, and Linda, but I think the goal was to get social psychology out there. You know, we know some things that are useful. Let's, let's get it out there so it could be used. So that was kind of our task, was to figure out what we know, which I found to be very difficult, um, and partly because this topic, unlike the others in that special issue, this topic is really broad. So you could almost put any topic in health psych under this self-regulation umbrella if you're not careful. So, um, so that was sort of the task. Um, I was also going to mention these couple big issues that were important to us from the beginning that um, shaped things, I think. Um, so Denise can jump in here as I mischaracterize this all. Uh, this, we, we, this was years ago that we wrote. It feels like even more than several years ago. Um, I can't actually remember what was in our head on some of these counts, but for, uh, for these couple things I can. Um, First, we wanted to think about self-regulation as a dynamic process and not just a single one act. Um, and that's because for most behaviors that we want to regulate, they don't just happen one time. They happen over and over and over. So um, that was really critical. Um, and then second and related to that, people don't regulate goals in a vacuum. Okay, people have many goals. Those goals compete for limited time, for limited resources sometimes they're incompatible with each other. So we wanted to incorporate that. Um, and then third, we didn't 
really want to concern ourselves with how people get information about what's healthy and how people come to decide whether they're vulnerable to an illness or disease or whatever. There's entire literatures on that. And we were interested in sort of the next step, you know, sort of in how that knowledge turns into behavior. So those were sort of the big, I feel like, sort of, I don't know, background things that sort of framed all of our conversations. I don't know if you think I'm, I'm looking at Denise on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, so Denise, anything you wanted to uh, add to that as well? Well, maybe add a little thing. Uh, I'm a health psychologist, but I work in a team of social psychologists, and I think most uh, health psychologists are more concerned with um, uh, traditional theory of planned behavior kind of frameworks making uh, it sound as, as if it were easy uh, if you know what to do that you can change your behavior and I think the contribution of social psychologists and especially those who work from a self-regulatory framework they can explain uh, that this is not so easy that's actually the hardest part and uh, show how complex it is but also show that you can uh, help people to self-regulate if you acknowledge that your the regulation of uh, behavior is difficult, especially in so far health is concerned. So maybe that's an addition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think another task uh, that both Denise and, and, and Tracy pointed out to that was challenging for us, uh, and, and one of our goals was to try to use a language that would help bridge the, the health and social psychology literatures. And we found ourselves um, Oftentimes, being buffeted by the by by uh, commentaries from the not not the commentaries in the in the actual uh, journal, but uh, from our friends and colleagues who gave us comments and suggestions about how to improve the paper. One of the striking things for me as a social psychologist was how different some of the assumptions about human behavior that they were between health and social. And what we tried to do in the paper was to highlight some of these assumptions um, and then to explain to each side. Uh, where the other side was coming from in order to sort of build a bridge so that we were not necessary what our hope was so that people were not arguing about the basic assumptions but rather to understand the different assumptions the different perspectives that people were coming from and then to use that as a way of bridging any potential misunderstanding so just to give one example and it's one that Denise already brought up is is this notion that you know once you have knowledge then you know behavior comes out as a result and and that comes out of the the, the theoretical traditions that are, that are, that are there in, in, in health psychology uh, and the theoretical models that they build, like you know theory of planned behavior and, and, and other models. Um, whereas I know for myself, uh, I was coming out of more dynamic models, uh, self-regulatory models, where there's a complicated interaction between what you know, what you're capable of doing in terms of control, and the environment that you find yourself in. So um, just articulating that assumption was very useful for me in trying to situate what I do uh, in this broader health site context, uh, context. And just writing the paper and having to acknowledge some of the inherent assumptions that the two fields make, I thought was very valuable for me, and I hope is very valuable for our readers, uh, in trying to understand how their research fits into this interface. Cool. Thank you. So I'm curious, um, given that uh, you guys sort of were trying to discuss the importance of some of the social, so sorry, so, social psychological perspectives for health psychology. Have you gotten a good sense of yet sort of what the response has been from, I guess you can say, more traditional health psychologists that might be as might not be as familiar with the self-regulation literature? Silence. Oh. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> this is our chance. There's some social psychologists here. Come on. I heard from, uh, I was at a conference of uh, the Health Psychology Division uh, in the UK and uh, we didn't talk about the paper but there was a, a keynote lecture announcing that theory of planned behavior may, be, may not have been so useful after all so I think there's a lot to do <laughs> when they only reached that conclusion uh, this year when I think a lot of other people in social psychology knew that for a while. So I think uh, we must uh, discuss more with the traditional health psychologists, so to say, uh, the relevance of this framework. Uh, but uh, I, I haven't... 
I haven't heard any critical comments so far. <laughs> well, it's yeah, it I, hasn't I, been out for too long so far either. So. No. I haven't heard any comments from, um, uh, from any experts or others who have a vested interest in this area, but I have heard from students who are interested in getting into the field. Um, so uh, in our depart in our in our in our university here, we talk a lot with the communications department, and the communications graduate students thought that the paper was a very useful starting place. Even even if they weren't interested in health psychology, um, some of them are interested in environment and and sustainability. Uh, but there are also those that are interested in health, and they they thought it was a useful overview uh, to at least um, uh, get a, get a handle on some of the things that social psychology uh, could had to offer. And I thought that was particularly gratifying. If if we're the first people that people go to when we kind of provide a roadmap, I, I would find that very flattering and exciting. Yeah, great. I mean, I think I mean I certainly read the paper. I think it was a phenomenal paper in terms of just you know laying out the issues really clearly, but also, I mean, I think it's. Self-regulation, I mean, it seems to be, it's, it's definitely, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like it's a topic that's sort of becoming a hot topic nowadays. Do you guys have the same sense that sort of, I'll judge by the registrations for this brown bag, <laughs> people love the topic. I'm just wondering where, um, do you see sort of self-regulation as being something that sort of become a huge topic just in recent years, or where, where is the interest coming from? You mean in health psychology? Because it's been, there. I think there's it's self-regulation all over the place for a while mm -hmm. in most uh, social psychology journals. And, and you, you're asking if it's going to be the same in health psychology? Well, I think, you know, just in general, I think just in a couple of years, at least among social psychology, self-regulation sort of become, I mean, I think it's a very important topic for now. I'm just wondering if, if you had a sense of sort of uh, where the, the the great interest is coming in now is, is originating from. Maybe it could be what you're alluding to in terms of, you know, people notice that, you know, the breakdown of, or the theory of planned behavior isn't quite doing as good of a job as people had hoped. So maybe there's some big link there that, that is being, um, that's being missed. And so it seems like self-regulation work might sort of bridge that. I know in social psychology, John, um, I think the interest in self-regulation has tracked an increasing interest in motivation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we want to understand, just like in the past people looked at attitude behavior consistency, I think with the increase of interest in motivation, there's a, there's a desire to look at uh, motivation behavior consistency. And to understand that link, one has to understand self-regulation. So I know within social psychology, I think self-regulation is getting increased attention mm -hmm partly because of this rise in motivation, and then that brings along with it this, this interest in motivation behavior consistency. I'm shocked. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize it was getting to be a hot topic. I have no idea. <laughs> this could just—I mean, it's, it's. I think it's. I, I definitely think it's a very important topic. I think it's just more that I people talk to people. I think uh, definitely seems like that's something that they're more and more recognizing as being really an integral part of health behavior. I mean, you have to do more than just convince people to make the changes, but sort of get them to actually be able to select the right goals, pursue them in the right way, resist temptation, and that's where I think a lot of the research that you guys are doing is really fascinating and really important. Um, another question I want to ask, since you guys, I think, collectively have uh, decades of research experience in the topic of self-regulation, I'm just curious, what um, were there particular sort of phenomena of self-regulation failures that drew you to be interested in the topic of self-regulation? Or what are some sort of the most, I guess, peculiar and interesting examples of self-regulation failure that you've seen in your experience researching this topic? Peculiar? Did you say peculiar? Peculiar or interesting or just... Because I know, Tracy, you study quite a bit of uh, eating behavior, as do you, um, Denise. Is yeah. there, what is it about the yeah. self-regulation of eating behavior that interests you guys so much? That it's impossible. <laughs> that, <laughs> it, what's harder? Nothing is harder. I mean, it's interesting to me for that reason, just that it's, just why should it be this hard? It's so very difficult. But I think of that as the common self-regulation failure. So I don't know, you're looking for an example of something odd or unusual that's not going to be eating, because eating's everyone, everyone fails at that. I don't know, I, I'm probably misconstruing the question now. 
But Denise, what were you about to say about eating? I wasn't going to say anything, but I will now. now I think it's the prototypical example, because, uh, especially because of the overweight epidemic. But I'm, if I'm really critical about the whole approach of self-regulation, then you, in a way you can wonder whether self-regulation of eating behavior is possible, as you say, because mm -hmm. we only have to self-regulate because there's so much food. If, if for 40 years ago or so you didn't have to self-regulate, you just ate what was on your plate and there was no, there were no temptation, it was just a, a kind of a normal behavior to survive. And now um, I think uh, self-regulation becomes relevant when things, either foods or consumer goods, become a temptation. And I think the, the interesting thing about self-regulation is that there is a context, situations that present us with, uh, with, 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 uh, with challenges that, uh, that we have to resist things that we that we don't want to. And um, since there's so much food and there's so much pressure from health psychologists and medical people to stay lean, self-regulation becomes an issue uh, in eating behavior. So, But if you're asking for a, a, a typical example, I think you just have to, to, um, to go out in the streets and, and go in a restaurant and see how many people eat and how difficult it is. It's uh, actually, hard to imagine that eating can become so difficult, <laughs> where, where, and it's kind of normal behavior, actually. Mm -hmm. so. Can right. I just say, Ken, I know you're about to say something, but can I just add one quick thing, just right off of what Denise was saying? That whenever I tell anyone that I study self-control or self-control of eating, 100% of the time, there are no exceptions to this, the first thing they always say is, oh, God, I would. <laughs> tell me when you find out. I, I, you know what I mean? Every single person is like, oh, I gotta get me some of that. So, I, 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 I completely <laughs> concur with both the observations that Denise and Tracy wrote. And I think one of uh, the, one of the things that drew me to self-regulation, and it's actually one of the reasons why I'm excited to hear about the response that people have to this paper, um, is because most of the theories that exist that we have, uh, particularly coming out of health psychology, but also out of economics and, and, and the medicine uh, and, and decision making, assumes that people will be rational and will pursue what's in their best interest. And I think as a psychologist, self-regulation provides an opportunity for us to say, it should be easy. Why is it so hard? Um, and and every, all of the, if you look at all our models, the, our models predict it should be easy. Um, at least those coming out of health psychology, economics, they suggest that you know, given the right information and given the right uh, setting, um, everything should be very straightforward. People are smart. People are capable. Um, and so the fact that it is so difficult, I think, presents the really interesting question, which is we all think it should be easy. We all know it's not. And I think that conundrum is the thing that really interests me, where we have expectations and hopes that it will be straightforward. But then when we delve into it, we realize how complicated it is. And I think that's what makes it really interesting. Um, another question. Uh, also, I've, I've got some questions I can ask. But if anybody in the audience also has uh, questions they'd like to pose to the presenters, uh, please uh, raise your hand or uh, type in some questions into the chat box. Um, one question I want to ask you guys um, is sort of in the review that you did for the paper and also just your awareness of the self-regulation literature, um, I'm just wondering what, um, what do you guys view as sort of some of the most exciting and interesting new directions in research on self-regulation, um, whether it's your own work or the work of colleagues that you have. I'm just wondering if you can sort of share uh, what you think um, some of the most interesting directions are and also I guess the second question I could pose is, what are some areas of research that there's really nothing on, we know nothing about, and really are just prime for people to start investigating? I, I, uh, can I say something? Uh, I think uh, also following up on the previous question, we were talking about self-regulation, but 90% of the time it's not about self-regulation success, but about self-regulation failure. Just as Ken said, we know uh, that it could be done, but why is it so hard? So I think one of the under-researched areas is self-regulation support. 
how can we, and I don't mean in kind of therapy or training, but more in, in providing people with contexts or social norms or situations that may, may guide uh, self-regulation. Now it seems that we create environments that make it even harder for people to, self, to do what they actually want to do and make it uh, extra challenging either whether it relates to health but also when it comes to consumption of all kinds of goods or spending versus saving. So as psychologists I think uh, we now are much have been focusing much on goal setting and goal striving but maybe it's time to move on and see how uh, not tell people that they should set different kinds of goals or think of other ways to pursue these goals but think of ways to to create environments that help make it easier to pursue those goals and I think that's really under researched I, I, completely <laughs> I completely agree with Denise and related to this is um, some of some of the work that I find really exciting is uh, using terms that Roy Baumeister has used himself um, the differences between playing defense and playing offense when it comes to mm -hmm. self-regulation. Um, so as Denise points out, we really do focus on failures, and we don't know very much about the people who you might refer to as the super regulators. Um, and so a lot of our insights come from people who are struggling, and one might ask the question, should we not, should we, should we not study those who are remarkably successful and so rather than trying to develop interventions based on our studies of people who are not doing the task well, why don't we base interventions based on the people who are actually succeeding and doing well? Um, and so, so you know, you, you wouldn't want to learn how to fix a watch by throwing a watch in the water and then watching it, trying to fix it once it's waterlogged. You would want to take a watch that was fully functioning and taking it apart while it's working. And I think, I think there's been a movement, although I think you know I, I actually would like to see more of it of us not focusing on failure, but us mm -hmm. focusing on success and understanding, as Denise says, the situational factors and, 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 and the mindsets that promote success in more of a proactive kind of way, as opposed to trying to understand, how, instead of avoiding failure, wouldn't it be a nice to study approaching successes? And sort of just to even go like one notch, maybe more specific, um, and you guys probably, I don't know, maybe you won't agree with me at all, but it seems to me that we will have, we'll be able to study success better, we'll be able to focus on that more if we stop focusing on the one strategy of willfully resisting temptation and start focusing on the, uh, what I think of as the smart strategies, is in a Denise's um, her uh, saying that, that, that you have there, uh, if you can't be strong, you have to be smart. We put that thing in the paper. Yeah. Um, most of the focus has been on the strong type strategy, that brute force strategy of resist that thing that's there. And, uh, and that's why I feel like the focus has been so much on failure, because that strategy seems, it's really fragile. That's a tough one. It's not going to hold up so much, I think. So. Um, so I think the more hopeful, positive sort of direction is to focus on those more successful strategies. And that's what they're seeing in, um, like, uh, Will Hoffman's uh, big, giant daily diary study where they're looking at people as they go about their daily life and looking at what they regulate and what strategies they use and what works and what doesn't. And it seems like the main thing that they keep showing is that people who are successful at self-regulation are the people who don't have to encounter things that they need to resist. So, and which, so that's the smart strategies. Those seem to be the ones working. So, um, so I think that's a good, we're still answering the what's an exciting direction. So I think that's an exciting direction. And that's also intertwined with getting out of the lab and into people's daily life. Because you can't really, in the lab, study the strategy of rearranging your day so that you don't walk past the bakery. You know, that's not really a lavish thing to get at, but it works. So, I don't know. Oh, I, I completely agree with Tracy. I mean, I think, I think some of the reasons why we've focused on failure is it's easy to get failure in the lab. 
it's a lot harder to get success, and I think it's because we don't give people the opportunity to engineer their environments in the lab. <laughs> part of part of lab part of lab studies is to have tight control um, and tight control of the of the circumstances, and not to let uh, participants dictate the terms. Um, and I think you know to study self-regulation. I completely agree with uh, Tracy. Um, I think we have to allow for more degrees of freedom, and, and it may it may require. Uh, some of us to get out of the lab and actually talk to people who are people. who are regulating uh, on their own, uh, and and I think Tracy points out some of the these smart strategies. Um, these are things that are very difficult to study in the lab, or at least with the methods that we have right now. Yeah, great, thank you. I think uh, Ken Walton had a question, sort of as you guys were talking about. I think some of sort of the the, the environmental influences on on self regulation and also. His question is, uh, self-regulation doesn't occur in a vacuum. Um, as social psychologists, shouldn't we also pay attention to, in quotes, other regulation in both senses of the term? How are self-regulation behaviors affected by others and on how we affect others' self-regulation? So I'm just wondering if you guys have given any thought about that or if, if what your thoughts about that question would be. Well, actually, I was going to say when you were saying what, what are exciting new directions or whatever, I was going to mention um, that there's just a little bit of research on and there needs to be more research on uh, close relationships and self-regulation and uh, the little bit, well, maybe there's a ton out there, I don't know. The little bit that I know about that's out there is really fascinating and it seems to me that's a, well, again, I could just, I could just be unaware of what's out there, but it seems to me it's a big untapped area. I, I would absolutely about. agree and, and I think um, just going back to the topic of smart regulation, if I have, if I know that I'm not very good at avoiding temptations, and I'm not very good at, if I have weak willpower, so that when you give me a temptation, I cave, it would be very smart for me to surround myself with people who are very good at controlling me. In other words, by delegating control away from self because it's so weak, and delegating it to strong other people. Um, that would actually be a very effective strategy. And again, that's the kind of thing that I think lab-based research, and I'm one of these researchers, has trouble sort of coming to grips with because that's very difficult to study in the lab. We bring this person into the lab, and they will fail miserably. And yet, in their real lives, if they're surrounded by strong people who help them you know, avoid the temptation, and when they're about to indulge, these people are you know, holding them back and saying no, um, that was very smart of them. I mean, they, they, they've selected really good partners. Um, and this is some of the reasons. I think these conclusions are coming out of the research in, in, in relationships. Uh, work by Eli Finkel and Grania Fitzsimmons, I think, are doing great work that kind of point to some of these uh, you know, other reg uh, sort of delegating responsibility uh, to other people, delegating the control to other people. I, I think they're starting but to do But I thought that made that it not great. work. I thought when um, you delegated it, it failed, or it, when you delegated it, you totally stopped trying at all, because you... I, right, so, I so the, the success of these strategies looks, uh, my reading of the literature is that the success of these strategies requires picking people who are going to be there, you know, so if, if you pick people who are only around occasionally, that would be bad, uh, but like any strategy, I think it's fitting, you know, the right, pe the right strategy to the right problem, and, and, you know, so for example, if it's your significant other, uh, partner, life partner. If they're around a lot, it's a great strategy. Um, but if they're not around a lot, obviously, it'd be less successful. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not contradicting anything that Tracy's saying. I think I, I think it goes back to the general theme of. I think the general theme is picking the right strategy for the right problem. And I think different people might pick different strategies, and that requires, as as Denise and, and Tracy have pointed out, being smart. Yeah. And maybe we can go even one step further because we now we have been talking about uh, other significant others or actual re uh, relationships but you know people feel uh, we have taken a very individualistic approach until now that people are struggling on their own with all these temptations and the social norms we think uh, all others may be capable or, or either of resisting uh, these temptations, while there are a lot of temptations around, so if we, if there's more discussion or more explicit norms about how to behave amidst of all these temptations, maybe it would be more normal to neglect them or resist them or whatever other kind of smart strategy you might want to uh, use. 
but it's not only about uh, the actual others, but also about the social environment, how people think. And maybe we should talk a lot more about how these environments may threaten self-regulation in order to help people to, uh, to deal with them. And uh, so that they feel less alone now and fighting uh, uh, for their goals. So. Yeah, true. So I think we all agree with Ken's uh, remark that uh, the situation should be more become more prominent topic of research. Uh. Definitely. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating idea. Just thinking about yeah, the self-regulation successes as being people that maybe they're not success because they have some amazing willpower, but it's just they know how to structure their environment in ways that doesn't make it so they have these these conflicts yeah. that other people experience. If you are not so tempted, you don't have to use your willpower. So that would be the easiest uh, strategy. Uh, it makes right. a whole lot of sense. <laughs> well, uh, by the way, yeah. you heard it here first. Ken Fujita just coined the phrase "smart regulation." <laughs> I think that's that's got to get out there. That that's don't you think that? I mean, it's it's based on the Denise's quote. Hey, what's the word "smart" in in Dutch? Maybe we should. Change the I can say it in Dutch but, and shock everybody, but it is the full sentence is we need sterkis moet slim zijn. Don't laugh now. But um uh smart is slim. <laughs> but not slim as you're slim, uh -oh. but slim in Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we stay with the English then. Yeah, that's better I guess. All right, uh, we have another question. Uh, this one's from Janet Tomiyama. Uh, it's actually a good question. It's a question I wanted to uh, pose as well. Is because um, I know in the review that you uh, that you put together, you drew from some research in the health psychology arena, but also you know there's a lot of relevant research in self-regulation from other domains. For example, um, organizational domains or achievement, educational contexts. Mm -hmm. And the question that Janet has is, um, do you think self-regulation of health is special in some way? In other words, are the processes that make a person avoid a brownie the same processes that might make a person avoid being racist or, you know, regulate their behavior in some other non-health context? I'm just wondering if you guys have given any thought to how regulation of health behavior might be unique in um, when you're looking at the different ways in which self-regulation actually impacts life. Uh, well, I have some thoughts about it. I think self-regulation of health and uh, is even harder than in other domains because health is, well, in the Netherlands at least, people uh, think the health is the most important thing in their life and they would, uh, it's more important than, for example, safety or relationships, they value health a lot and still they do these irrational things. So because it's so important and because it's so difficult, I think self-regulation of health is more challenging even than uh, self-regulation of your work performance or study performance. It's a way of a, a personal impression, but I think it's, health is harder just because it's so important and so difficult to deal with, but maybe other people have some other observations, Trace, you can. <laughs> it's funny because the health, I agree with you, health is harder, I think, um, and if you were going to talk about eating, that's a whole separate ball game because you're dealing with, you know, physiological pressures and whatnot, but in general, I think health stuff is harder to regulate, and it's weird because the motivator is the strong, I mean, it's the strongest motivator. It's death. You know, it's like if you don't do your homework, well, whatever, you're not going to die. But the fact that it's so hard to regulate these health-related things, despite them having the, 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 you know, the most horrible motivator of all, is I think is amazing. I think that just shows how hard it is. Because that's I, not I, from a from a social psychology perspective, I'm not sure that health is qualitatively different in terms of its processes, but I completely agree with Denise and Tracy. I do think it's harder. Um, I think people are more defensive about it because it's scarier. So I think the stakes are all higher when it comes to health, so we are more, we're more resistant to change because considering change is, is scary because it means considering, I mean, as the terror management guys have highlighted, considering a change of behavior means accepting that my current behavior is encouraging 
negative, you know, the impending end of my life here. We're sort of accelerating it. Um, and so there's greater resistance on the forefront. And, and two, health has a way of, it is one of these motives that, that, that is, is in the background, and it doesn't really bother us until we have concrete evidence. And usually by the time we get concrete evidence, it's too late. So it's one of these really interesting self-regulation problems where it's very much about, it's, it's a lot better to do preventative stuff, but that's the very situation in which we're the least motivated to do it. Um, and so I think, in, so I, I think in terms of the psychological processes, I think they're more or less the same, but I, that's not to then diminish the challenges because I think yeah. health provides, because the stakes are so much higher when it comes to health and because we're, you we're generally only concerned about health when it's, when it's a problem, not when it's okay, um, it, mm -hmm. it, it becomes hard to, to get it on the, on, on the front burner as opposed to the back burner, and, and for this reason, mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting challenge. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, I mean, we tried in the paper to you know, to highlight things that we thought would be universal, that weren't just about health. That in, and as you said, John, it came from literatures that weren't health literatures, a lot of it, some of it. Good. Uh, another question I want to ask uh, is, given uh, the work you've been doing and also the research that you drew from in writing review, um, what do you think um, seem to be some of the most uh, promising potential interventions for improving people's self-regulation ability? Have you seen anything that even comes close to approaching a uh, what you might call a magic bullet or, or something that really seems to be the way to go to get people improved? We've all been talking about smart regulation. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's an idea. I mean, is there, it seems like, seems like that would work, but it also doesn't sound like there's tons of research on that yet. I would put nudges in the category of smart regulation mm -hmm. because they're changing the environment and they're changing the situation so that you don't encounter the unhealthy thing or or um, the unhealthy thing becomes less uh, less likely of a of a choice. So in that sense, that I think that would again not a magic bullet, but I think it would fit. So. One of the things that I think is uh, really exciting and, 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 and really is kind of emerging from the research that is being done on the, the, need, for, uh, the need for belongingness as well as from self-affirmation research is, is if we can tie health to more than just health, uh, it appears that a lot of research would suggest that, that it's more motivating and thus then helps promote uh, greater self-regulation and greater learning about what works. Um, so one of the things I was struck by, I had the opportunity to work with some gastric bypass surgery patients and oh. trying to talk about, you know, it, it, weight loss itself is not a particularly motivating, it's not a particularly energizing goal. Um, but what was really interesting to, for me in talking to them and, and, and sort of I think the literature more broadly speaks to this is the importance of others. So as soon as you tie health to connection to others, being there for others, that others depend on you, that you want to be there for others, you care about other people. Um, just how much more motivating that was and how much more it was people were then willing to engage in practicing self-regulation and improving on it. Um, it's not really a self-regulation intervention, it's more of a motivational intervention, but I think it's one that's inherently social psychology and that, that's what I find very exciting about it. That the, somehow linking health to how much I care and want to be with other people seems to be very powerful and I think the literature from social psychology would suggest that a lot could be done with it. I don't know how much has been done with it, um, but I, I, was, I, mean, I think there's enough coming out of the social psychological literature right now that would suggest that it would be very powerful. And I wonder if in addition to combining that with some kind of, so using others uh, or my, my connectedness to others as a motivator and then some kind of educational intervention whereby you, tr you, you teach people how to you know, strategically go about promoting their goals. I think the combination of those two things of motivation and ability are, 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 are provide an op a really exciting opportunity. I think if I may add something, that there are a lot of exciting ideas, just like the, uh, the one Ken is talking about, that health is a, is a long distance goal and people want to, want to have mm. some rewards more in a more uh, immediate, uh, in the more immediate future, but I think most of these great ideas haven't been translated in formats that we can deliver 
to normal people uh, in, in, in medical settings. And I still think there, there is a great need of new ideas because in these medical settings there is a lot of emphasis still on education, uh, increasing motivation without people helping to do the real thing what we expect from them. So I think uh, if we can think of ways to translate our exciting ideas and test them in the, in the medical or professional setting, that would be great because there hasn't been, there, has, there isn't so much uh, research available uh, in terms of interventions for patients or, or preventative interventions. And there's, that's another thing for the research agenda, I think, uh, if we want to promote self-regulation uh, beyond the lab. Great. Uh, speaking of uh, research agendas, there's a question from uh, Linda Cameron, one of the editors for the uh, for this special issue. Um, she asked, uh, did the process of writing this article influence your own research in any way? That is, did you start any new studies or make changes in projects as a consequence of this collaboration? Totally. <laughs> I completely did. I'm serious. I mean, from these conversations with Ken and Denise, I really started to think a lot about these different strategies and which ones worked for who and when. And um, I definitely started, I haven't done any research, well, I mean, I've definitely started planning and wrote a grant to uh, do that exact kind of thing. Uh, right, to... right around when Bill Hoffman's paper came, Will Hoffman's paper came out, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, just like Tracy, I mean, I, I, I very much thought the collaboration um, made me think really seriously. For me, it made me seriously think about health as a – take more seriously the notion that I could use the health psychology domain as a test bed for social psychological theory. Uh, and in doing so, it's really exciting because not only can you explore new ideas and new hypotheses, but you can do so in a way that's highly relevant. And so I know working on this paper has really inspired me to – to, to go out there and try to find uh, collaborators in the health domain that, that, that might be uh, interested in, in, in testing these, um, again, maybe outside the lab, um, but also just to, 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 to go out there and to talk to uh, health psychologists. So one of, the, one of the outputs from having written this paper is that um, I've gotten a lot more um, close to the nursing programs, the pharmacology, uh, the pharmacy programs uh, here at OSU, and, and I'm actually now part of their curriculum where I talk about self-regulation following knowledge, and so I help, uh, I teach one of their lectures, um, and so that's been great, just an opportunity to talk cool. to students, and I've been really, really happy with the feedback that I've gotten because they, they feel like it helps fill in the blanks that they see um, uh, from their training. And, uh, so, so, so I'm not. Sh so, research has been a little bit slower, but that's only because research takes a long time to set up. But certainly, the educational components have come along very quickly and have inspired me to go and do it and put my money where my mouth is. That's really cool. <laughs> that's really cool. Great. So, I think uh, there's about five minutes or so left. Um, do you guys have time for one more question? Sure. One more. Okay. <laughs> then we have uh, Tracy and I uh, desperately are in need for food. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The uh, question, this one's coming from uh, Jenna Cummings. Um, how do you think self-regulation differs over development and our approaches to supporting behavior change, should it reflect that? For example, the kinds of goals relevant to a teenager wanting to lose weight to look good versus an obese adult wanting to lose weight to avoid death. So I guess do you see any differences in self-regulation, either the goals that people pursue or the ways they go about pursuing it um, from a developmental context? It's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, and I think um, I know that as a social psychologist, um, I do not take this question seriously enough, uh, <laughs> mostly because our convenience sampling means that we deal with college students. Um, and I will say that I am becoming increasingly fresh. I'm impressed with both Denise and Tracy's ability to continue studying eating over the years because I have found it to be very frustrating with teenagers because, <laughs> to be honest, they don't really have weight loss problems. Um, they think they're <laughs> invincible and they can do it. It's just a matter of putting, you know, putting commitment to it, whereas I think folks who have graduated are now in a more unstructured lifestyle with kids and lots of stressors, uh, self-regulation of eating and other related issues becomes that much harder. 
Um, we also know that people's go because goal, people's goals change over time, any intervention that we might create from social psychology needs to be sensitive to those changes in goals. And I think we have a tendency, at least I do as a researcher, to assume that everyone's goals are the same as mine. Uh, and it, it, I've, I'm, I'm increasingly learning that it's very important to talk to the intervention folks, the, the, to, to really get to know the phenomenon before uh, we swoop in there and say, you should do this and you should do that, which is you know, really arrogant uh, to think that you know everything and that simply, um, you know, that, that, that simply Im implementing the procedures will make everything uh, come out magically. Uh, I, I do think, um, I, I know that one of the lessons that I learned and have been learning uh, from doing health psych research is, is that these are things that we have to be sensitive to. Uh, we know, for example, older adults, they're more interested, less in improvement and more interested in uh, enjoying positive affect and positive experiences. If we know this, then we ought to, we ought, we're going to need to leverage different sources of motivation and different sources of different tactics. Um, you know, the, the the role of others might be more sensitive during certain periods of time than others. Um, you know, we know when you're older and when you're younger, you know, other people are really important, but for very different reasons. And, and if we're going to use interventions that involve others, if we're going to involve interventions that, you know, highlight, you know, improving. They may or may not work given different populations and the different stages of development they're in. So I actually think this is a terrific question, and I don't think there's enough done. At least in my research, we don't take it seriously enough. I, I, don't, I won't speak for Denise and Tracy. No, I, th I have nothing to add. I think you, you, uh, you're completely right that we, we don't uh, take account of, the, of these the developmental differences and these stages enough before uh, we don't do we do research with college students or with adults, but we well we record their age, but that's that's all, and we we are not sensitive enough to uh, how their lives and the stages of their lives and and the circumstances um, affect their health goals and their opportunities for actually working on these goals, which might be uh, it might be difficult if you have a job and young children to bother about your health, uh, even because there's so much other things going on, and we haven't paid uh, enough attention to that so far. So I agree that it's a great question and an important issue. Yeah, a huge untapped area, especially with older people. Mm. You know, there's some, I mean, none of us specifically, none of the three of us um, study children, but there is some phenomenal self-control research on, ch with, on children, you know, Angela Duckworth type stuff. Uh, so it's, it's not being completely ignored, but the elderly issue, wow, that we got to get on that. Bill Klein has some stuff with self-regulation with self in, in, in elderly, but it's been mostly applied to things like addiction and, um, mm. uh, 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 and gambling, uh, propensity to gambling. Uh, you know, they have declining prefrontal yeah. cortex, so they have problems more with impulse control. But we, other than that research, it's not applied yeah. to health, and I don't know, beyond saying that they're just less good at it, I'm not sure we know anything more beyond that. Lots more research we all can do. <laughs> um, I think we're just about out of time, so I just want to thank you all for your questions, and also a very special thanks to uh, Tracy, Denise, and Ken for taking time out of their schedules to talk about this. I think it's, it's been really, really insightful and really, really uh, informative. So um, thank you all, and thank you guys. since we're on a webcam, we can wave bye to each other. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks everybody, and uh, the, I believe there will soon be an announcement out for one of our next uh, virtual brown bags, so look out for those, and um, we'll sign off. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Bye.